Grit, determination, rising to the challenge. That's what this summer of sport has been all about for Ineos. With the incredible victory at the Tour de France for Team Ineos, eyes are now turning to Eliud Kipchoge as he gears up to break the two-hour marathon barrier. But that is just the tip of the iceberg as every day throws up new and more exciting challenges for Ineos. This month, I'm in Nice to bring you the inside story as we complete the purchase of Olympic Gymnast Club de Nice, one of France's oldest football clubs and a founder of League One. Stay tuned as we tell you about this incredible story and more from the most exciting company in the world. Let's kick off. This is In TV. In this episode, we delve into the world of French football and explore our latest acquisition as we become owners of OGC Nice. He's got all the attributes we were looking for in a football club. Good players, good squad, he's got a good history. We get a sneak preview of how the 159 team and Elliot Kipchoge are preparing to break the world record time for a marathon. We wanted this to be a big city marathon. For his psychology when he's running is to have fans around him, have people cheering, have a crowd. And Vienna was able to offer us all of that. We unveil the name for our new uncompromising 4x4 and reveal where we'll be building it. It's always been our ambition as a UK manufacturing company to assemble the vehicle in the UK. We take a trip to the fjords of Iceland, where Ineos is helping to protect North Atlantic salmon. If we don't do anything, and don't do anything fast, it's never coming back. It's gone forever. We explore how Ineos is partnering with innovative companies to tackle plastic waste. In recent years, we've been evaluating new upcoming technologies that will enable us to create polystyrene and our other products, ultimately, from recycled material. And as always, we'll provide the latest news from across the INEOS group. I'm here at the Allianz Riviera Stadium, where the latest member of the INEOS sports family is gearing up for match day. First team coach is France and Arsenal legend Patrick Vieira, and we'll be hearing from him later. This season of top-class French football is sure to be a cracker. Let's take a look now at the great history of this club and what's in store for the future. Capital of the Côte d'Azur and the fifth largest city in France, Nice is home to spectacular beaches and landscapes, enjoyed by thousands of tourists every year. But it's also home to one of the founding members of the French Football League, OGC Nice. Le club de l'OGC Nice a une importance fondamentale à Nice parce que on a une identité très forte dans, dans, dans cette ville. On est complètement positif pour cette saison. Même si elle avait mal démarré, on savait que avec l'arrivée d'Ineos, on, on allait surmonter les épreuves et revenir petit à petit. In August, Ineos announced the acquisition of OGC Nice as part of the Ineos Football Group and ushered in a new chapter for the club. Everyone is very enthusiastic about the arrival of Ineos. From the first meeting until now, we have met people of great quality who have made us want to share this project. Bob Ratcliffe, CEO of Ineos Football, is keen to take the club forward and make them European contenders. He's got all the attributes we were looking for in a football club. Good players, good squad, real fan base, real enthusiasm, and he's got a good history. We think with measured investment over the next three to five years, we can put it in a place where it's competing regularly in Europa League Champions League. So if we apply sort of the Ineos values, I think we'll get to the right place. With four league titles to their name, won in a glittering period of the 50s, the club has a rich history. Their last cup triumph came in 1997, winning the Coupe de France. Ineos are looking to instill some of their trademark grit and determination to help the club achieve success again. Ce qui arrive au club, c'est quelque chose d'incroyable, d'impensable. Jamais j'avais imaginé que Ineos puisse à un moment donné racheter le club. Et j'espère en tout cas qu'il y aura une autre personne, un autre capitaine qui pourra soulever ce trophée rapidement. 
Success is something familiar to former Arsenal Invincible Patrick Vieira, who has been lead coach since last season. I think Ineos coming to our football club is a, is a massive step forward, not just for our football club but for the French league as well, because Ineos is one of the biggest brands worldwide and I think we can be even more ambitious because we, we have the, the experience of people who has been really successful in business and in uh, different, uh, different sports, but it's really exciting to be part of it. With a superb stadium that hosted World Cup football last summer and a fantastic new training centre, the club has a bright future ahead of it. Our ambition is to be honest is to continue to, to, to increase the level of the club, but also to, to develop the club with the mentality, with the capacity each season to, to, to be able to compete. From the beautiful game to a spectacular feat of athletic endurance, we go now to Vienna with a team behind the 159 Challenge supporting Olympic champion Eliud Kipchoge are attempting to break the two-hour marathon barrier. Since Eliud Kipchoge announced his goal to break the two-hour marathon, the last great athletic barrier, Experts from the INEOS Sports Group and Athletics have feverishly searched for the perfect location. In June, INEOS announced that Vienna would be the host. We wanted this to be a big city marathon. You know, we didn't want to be out in an aerodrome or by a river or downhill. One of the absolutely key components for Elliot um, and for his psychology when he's running is to have fans around him, have people cheering, have a crowd. And um, Vienna was able to offer us all of that. Now, with just under a month to go, the team is gearing up for a test event in Prater Park to ensure the INEOS 159 Challenge is a success. Starting with performance, they're going to be looking at exactly what's it going to take for Elliot to be able to run the sub two hours. The most important thing about this challenge is the time. So making sure that that all works, that each of the kilometre markers are set out correctly, that all the timing chips work, and that that all then goes back into the control centre so on the actual day of the challenge they can see exactly what's going on and they know where they're at. And then finally you have the engagement team, which is making sure that the whole world gets to see this challenge. And so the broadcast teams are checking camera angles, all of the social media teams, the press teams, the photographers, again checking positions, starting to create content that we can share with the world once the challenge gets underway. The 159 Challenge is a quite complex project in a, in a lot of ways. What we're trying to do here is to test a number of different systems, camera systems, how to interact with the runners, how not to affect performance and to come away with a clear picture of what we think the final camera plan should be for the actual challenge in just over a month's time. As viewers across the globe will be able to tune in and even choose which angle of the race they want to watch. We've got a, a camera on a car in front, a non-polluting bike behind. We've got a horizontal rail cam, crane cameras with the best shots that we can provide, but making sure that nothing we do will affect his performance in any way. On the track, nothing will be left to chance. Every detail of the race is being meticulously planned and analysed, from the clothing on Elliot's back to the direction of wind. But key to success will be the pacemakers, some of the world's best athletes who will help manage his speed and give him encouragement. The pacemakers are of the world's best standard. These are world champions, world record holders, Olympic medalists. There's a real togetherness and that's what makes it really special. But no matter how the planning goes, the success of the event will all come down to the work of one man. There's absolutely nobody else uh, that has a chance of breaking two hours in the marathon than Iliad. Look at any marathon that he's raced, nobody comes close to him. So there's just nobody better to attempt it. I think ultimately if Elliot Kipchoge manages to do this, it will be first of all an incredible moment in history and there'll be a generation of young marathon runners who look at this achievement and think I can do that one day. The whole point of this challenge for any of sport is to show people that no human's limited and I think that's what inspires all of us to, to make sure that this is a success. Perfect guys. <laughs> What an incredible goal, and what a challenge that is. Groundbreaking in more ways than one. We're right behind Elliot, and we'd love it if you were to tune in and cheer him on. Now, as well as making history on two legs, we're hoping to do it on four wheels, as we announce the manufacturing location and the name of our new 4x4 vehicle that we think is going to shake up the automotive world. 
Just two and a half years ago, Project Grenadier was conceived in a pub in Knightsbridge. The idea? To build an uncompromising, hard-working 4x4 to fill a gap in the market. We are a chemical company, but at heart we're a manufacturing company. If we can produce a vehicle which looks cool, retains that off-road ability, not homogenised jelly mould SUV, I think we can deliver that. With an initial core team of visionary designers and engineers, the project has gone from strength to strength. It's a global product that will be recognised hopefully soon all over the world. I certainly feel very proud to be a part of that journey. We have have a strong, experienced senior team leads and chief engineers that, that manage the, the overall progress. When do you have a chance to be a part of something like this? I mean, hardly ever. In September, at Glaciers Hall in London, Enios Automotive held a press event to unveil the name of the vehicle. After putting the question to the public on their website, there was one overwhelming response. We had some rogue ones. We had the old car in car face and um, lots of unprincipled ones. But by far the winner is the name of the pub. The name of the vehicle will be the Grenadier. Now that other car brands have moved into more premium SUVs and 4x4s, Grenadier will take on the much-needed role of a tough, uncompromising vehicle. A car for landowners, farm workers, explorers and many more. A permanent all-wheel drive vehicle to work in the mud, to work in the rain, under trailer conditions, being able to pull, being able to tow, being able to be versatile. We will also have some regular comfort features which in the 21st century you would expect but it again will be there because we feel it is something that is needed to do the job at the end of the day. After assembling a world-class engineering team and procuring the right parts, Ineos Automotive needed the right place to call home and, along with the name, announced where that place would be. Good evening, Noswaithaichi. A much needed boost for the car industry in Wales tonight as Ineos Automotive confirms it'll build its new 4x4 vehicle in Bridgend. Today, Sir Jim Ratcliffe announced that he's bringing up to 500 jobs to South Wales. It could prove a lifeline for some of the 1,700 workers facing redundancy at Ford Bridgend. It's always been our ambition as a UK manufacturing company to assemble the vehicle in the UK. £600 million will be invested by INEOS into the Grenadier project, which includes the construction of this new site in Bridgend, with work already underway. We are selecting Wales for various very good reasons. An element of it is also that it is a rural area which fits the product, where the farming tradition is still very live. I think it's great. We'll build something here that hopefully everybody is very proud of. And this is a packed edition of INTV, so we're moving straight on to Vopna Fjordor in Iceland. They've been fishing there for centuries, and INEOS is helping to preserve that environment and promote sustainable salmon fishing for the communities that depend on it. Iceland is one of the last safe havens of the Atlantic salmon. They spawn in the freshwater rivers in the northeast, but in recent years their numbers have been rapidly declining across the globe. This is a very important species ecologically and economically throughout much of the Atlantic, but particularly in Iceland. If we don't do anything and don't do anything fast, it's never coming back. It's gone forever. With the plight of the salmon growing by the day, Sir Jim Ratcliffe decided to take action. In recent years, he's been funding ways to help boost salmon numbers and has now brought together research teams from Imperial College London and the Marine and Freshwater Institute in Iceland to further study the issue. The cause for these declines is not entirely known. There are various reasons that might be behind this that we will investigate as part of this project. And the idea is really to try and find one or more smoking guns that might be causing this, this decline. We are measuring and investigating some of the key factors of the salmon life cycle. Counting fish with uh, electronic fish counter, estimating the spawning stock size, then we do juvenile survey, catching out migrating smolts, tagging them. The purpose of that is to estimate the ocean mortality. How many of migrating smolts are returning as adult fish? This research will aid the huge investment already taking place in the region. 
managed and implemented by Strangur Angling Club, who look after a number of key rivers. The first steps we took to improve the ecosystem was to reduce the equipment that you can use for fishing. Soon after that, we started catch and release in the river. Then we started building ladders. Salmon ladders are a series of steps carved into the rock face of waterfalls that allow salmon to reach new spawning grounds further upriver. Our goal has been to do this with as little involvement into nature. In some rivers, we have waterfalls that are impossible for fish. One thing that has been done is to take eggs and just to dig them in the gravel above a waterfall. By planting eggs in the river, hopefully in the next five or ten years, we will have a healthier and stronger stock. Every avenue to improve the ecosystems of the rivers, including the soil and vegetation around them, is being explored. We're putting this different kind of species, larches, birch, tea-leaved willow and woolen willow down, and it will enrich the soil. When you get a healthier vegetation along the rivers, then you get a healthier environment for the uh, organism living in the rivers. These scientific teams and groups are performing vital work to solve a growing crisis, but it couldn't be done without the support of the local communities. That's great that Mr. Radcliffe is concerned about the Atlantic salmon and helping the rivers as he can. Our biggest owners in the Angling Club is now Sir James Radcliffe, and he has said that all the income that we get from the river systems will be put into the rivers again. There is definitely signs that our work on the river has had some positive impact. We would like to leave these rivers and the environment up here in the northeast and hopefully all over Iceland in a better shape than we received it. Safeguarding the environment is a core principle for INEOS, and we're partnering with companies using breakthrough new technology to take old plastic and break it down into its base molecular components. Technology like this will eliminate plastic waste across the world and create a circular economy that will benefit us all. certainly is a victim of its own success, um, simply because it's such a highly engineered and tailored product. But on the other hand, it's also extremely easily disposed of. One of the, the challenges with plastic is some of the great attributes of it, the fact that it can be very low cost. Because it's low cost, you have a consumer who doesn't appreciate that value in the resource, and maybe it isn't being disposed properly. Today, the issue with uh, plastic waste mismanagement is at a point where it's really a crisis. The vast majority of 350 million tons or so of plastic that is produced a year goes to landfill. There's incredible value in changing that dynamic. I think society, with all the negative misconceptions about plastic today, forgets about how often we touch plastic throughout the day. From in the morning when we wake up, brush our teeth, put on clothes that contain plastic, go out for that run, use a water bottle that's made of plastic. It all comes down to how we handle our plastic waste. My name is Cassie Bradley. I'm the Sustainability and Circular Economy Commercial Manager for North America at Ineos Styrolution. Ineos Styrolution is the number one global leader in styrenics. So traditionally, we've been producing material that comes from fossil fuels. However, in recent years, we've been evaluating new upcoming technologies that will enable us to create polystyrene and our other products ultimately from recycled material. We have three partners that we're working with in North America. And Agilex, they're located out in Oregon. They have a depolymerization technology that converts polystyrene waste back into styrene monomer raw material. Our broad mission statement is to take plastic recycling from 10% to 90%. So with the Agilex process, we take all types of polystyrene, foams, rigids, films. We process them so they're easier to handle. We combine those materials into a feedstock for our reactor. The heat in the reactor breaks the polymers, turns it to a gas. The gas is taken off and quenched to an oil that then a company like Ineos can use 
So it is able to go back into food contact products, into pharmaceutical grade products. It can be used for anything the original virgin material could be used for. My name is uh, Mohamed Aboud. I am a product manager for Ineos Starolution. I'm part of a team uh, working on our sustainability project. It's a very exciting project for us. Myself and Cassie and others in the organization looking at how can we minimize waste? How can we drive into a more circular economy? Today we are visiting uh, PyroWave, one of our partners uh, here in Canada. They utilize the microwave technology to, drive, to run their process. And uh, essentially what that gives you is very good yields and very efficient way to convert the plastic waste back into the raw materials. PowerWave is a technology company. We've uh, developed a unique technology using microwaves to break down polystyrene into monomer. Because we have this powerful microwave element, we're able to maintain much more the structure of the monomer and we do not have to do an extensive amount of purification afterwards. And so we have the distillation column that, that essentially removes the impurities and enables the recovery of virtually pure styrene monomer that can be shipped and used as a virgin application. Green Mantra has been processing mixed plastics into products like polymer additives, inks, and dyes for several years now. We use and have developed technologies that allow us to redesign the molecule of a plastic and create different types of polymers. We do a lot of research on understanding upcycling of plastic, but also the value that it can create for the, the industries that we sell into. And the partnership that we have, it allows both sides to leverage their expertise. And we have a common goal which is we want to divert as much polystyrene from landfill as possible, and we want to create a circular system for the plastic. Circular economy is where you have the things that are in the system stay in the system. You don't really have much waste. You make sure that you are not consuming uh, more resources than you need. The type of partnership we have with Ineos Star Illusion can really prove how you can take a waste stream and through a, an innovative process, you can turn it into a valuable product usable in their process. These type of partnerships really can demonstrate the value of circular economy and how we can return waste into the loop. We don't see banning all plastics, but we see the need to find a way to recycle and reuse plastics to make that circular economy and to make people realize that plastics are the best solution for what they're currently used for. I am very excited about this. When people hear recycling, you always think of downcycling, things that you make very little value and now we have a recycling technology that allows you to capture the full value, really no waste, and you can do this as many times as, as you wish. I think that's, that's great. As a chemical engineer, I'm living the dream, being able to take new ideas and bring them to market. With these exciting new advances, we can have a positive impact on the world and change how people think about how we use plastic. Now, let's get the latest news from across the group. Earlier this year, INEOS sponsored 81-year-old Mavis Patterson as she completed a record-breaking cycle from Land's End to John O'Groats in just 24 days. On September the 7th, the Tour of Britain race kicked off and Team INEOS invited Mavis to come down and meet them and maybe pass on a few words of wisdom. So it was been a beautiful day because we've had some ghastly weather here and I was praying for a lovely sunny day and it came and also had the pleasure of meeting some of the INEOS team, which was, a, was <laughs> exceptionally nice for me. And there was some of them were saying, oh, I'm very impressed with you doing Land's End to John O'Groats. But um, anyway, it was lovely to see them all, and, we were, and the team did exceptionally well. I mean, they were in there um, among the first 10 or 20, something like that, but it was just lovely. I was following, there was a big screen in the town, and you, we could follow the whole in race, it was wonderful because I know all that country I live and that's where I've cycled. When I was training, I would cycle out there. So it was lovely to see them on the roads that I've been on. And it was just a wonderful day. After INEOS acquired OGC Nice, it is excited to announce that it is investing in the local community. For every goal the team score over the season, they will donate 200 euros to the OGC Nice Endowment Fund. This fund directly supports the Enfants Sans Douleur programme launched in 2005, which aims to support and publicise local charities that help children suffering from debilitating illnesses. This programme supports all the local associations d'aide à l'enfance de Nice, and that's something magnifique 
que va permettre euh, Ineos. Je pense que l'arrivée d'Ineos à l'OGC Nice est très positive pour le club, pour ses supporters, mais au-delà de ça, euh, pour toute euh, la ville de Nice. Ineos supports the children's charity, the Daily Mile, which works with schools across the globe to help children get fit for life. In the coming weeks, the initiative expects to announce that 10,000 schools have signed up. This means nearly 2 million children across 67 countries are taking part, with 5,000 schools in England alone. A growing network of research shows the many benefits of the Daily Mile for children's physical health and well-being, their mental health and their learning. Fantastic news for the charity and even more fantastic news for the health of children everywhere. Well, that's it for this edition of InTV. Next time, we're going to dedicate the whole show to the INEOS 159 Challenge as Eliud Kipchoge attempts to make history. Until then, that's full time from us. Thanks for watching.